All right, gonna go ahead and get started today. Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar for Your Eyes Only 2023 CRE Insights for Region 9 with the National Association of Realtors Chief Economist, Lawrence Young. We'd like to take a moment to thank and recognize the sponsors for all our chapters in this region. It's with their year-round support that we are able to bring you programs like this, as well as all the other exceptional events you've come to rely on. Our webinar today for Your Eyes Only 2023 CRE Insights in Region 9 with the National Association of Realtors Chief Economist Lawrence Chen is about to begin. Thank you everyone for joining again today. I'm Kelly Glenn, Senior Director of Leasing with the RMR Group and happy to serve as your incoming 2024 RVP for Region 9 with the CCIM Institute. For those who may not know, Region 9 consists of Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Welcome again to today's webinar. We're happy to share this webinar with everyone who is able to attend today. For members of the CCIM Institute, this is one of the many member benefits that are designed to help you adapt and thrive in the CRE industry. Lawrence is going to arm you with the knowledge that will help you understand where the economy is and where CRE markets may be heading as we very quickly approach 2024. I invite you to please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A tab throughout the session. We'll be answering as many questions as we can at the end of the session. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please also feel free to use the chat feature and we'll try to address those. The recording and accompanying presentation will be emailed to you after the event. Lawrence, welcome and thank you again for joining us today. I'll turn the show over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kelly, uh, for uh, inviting me to participate uh, in the economic, commercial, real estate outlook uh, condition. Uh, the overall story on commercial real estate is that this year has been a more of a challenge. Uh, anytime Federal Reserve raises interest rate like this, uh, which is the most aggressive rate hike policy uh, since the early 1980s, naturally it's going to be more difficult to borrow money to make those transactions, commercial real estate deals done. Now, fortunately for Kelly, she is from Charleston, uh, one of the more fast growing region of the country. So I'm sure that uh, the Charleston area has done quite uh, reasonably well, uh, even as the rest of the country uh, may have seen some challenges. Uh, furthermore, these four states, as I think about it, well, college football country, anytime you have Alabama and Georgia mentioned in the same uh, name, uh, you know, you don't want to consider that. I actually grew up in South Carolina, so I know that this is also a hunting uh, uh, area, meaning that uh, every Monday morning uh, in high school, the discussion among at least the boys was about hunting, you know, where do they go hunting? Uh, but thank you for inviting, and uh, let's go into what you can anticipate uh, in the upcoming year. So I'm gonna put the slide onto the screen uh, and then go from there. So hold one second as I put it on the full screen mode. Okay, here we are. So let's first uh, look at the interest rate policy. The graph begins from 2019. So in a sense, you may say 2019 pre-COVID it was a normal condition. I put three interest rates. The green is the policy coming from Washington, Federal Reserve policy, while the blue would be the prime rate, just normal business loan for the bank's most uh, favorable clients. So the interest rate that would charge to their most favorable clients for just normal business loan condition. Uh, while the little uh, scrilling uh, Kirby line, the little red line, uh, is the 10-year treasury yield, which will be more borrowing costs for the more longer term. So if someone wants to take out a 10-year uh, loan uh, to buy a nail salon, uh, well, they will be looking uh, at the 10-year treasury yield movement and then a few additional percentage above that uh, for those commercial real estate transactions. But as you can see on the chart, in 2020, when we were faced with that ugly COVID, Federal Reserve went all in, 
zero interest rate policy, bring all the interest rates down. Why put your money in the bank if you get zero uh, and therefore people were chasing yield, including in commercial real estate. But look what has happened from spring of 2022. Interest rate hike, interest rate hike, essentially pushing up all interest rate upwards. Uh, the red line does not follow one to one relationship, but still rising condition to the highest level in 20 years. Furthermore, the latest data coming from Federal Reserve related to commercial loan lending standards. So one year ago in 2022, the question was asked, qualitative question, construction and land development loan, like building warehouses, the real retail shop and such, uh, were you tightening it compared to before? And as you can see in the left-hand side, the uh, left-hand table, the middle column, 50% indicated they were tightening, while 48% or equal number essentially saying no change, almost none in indicating easing condition or 2%, uh, essentially zero. But this year, the figure completely tightened further. So even more and more banks are indicating tightening standard for commercial real estate loan. So not only was it higher interest rates, but to get those loans, even at higher interest rate, became with greater scrutiny than before. On the right-hand table, you can see those loans secured by commercial buildings are so moving in similar way. If we look at the general consumer loan, so this will be not for your client for commercial real estate, but maybe for your own personal need, uh, which is credit card interest rate above 20%. In fact, averaging 23%, just exceptionally high levels. Uh, some people may say, you know, for college students, they should just throw away those credit cards, you know, just go to the library, check out those free books, uh, because this interest rate will be a huge burden going into the future. But we also understand there are some families across America who are living paycheck to paycheck. At times, they have to resort to credit card, but now they will be hit with this high uh, interest rate condition. New car loans, which had been about 5% interest rate to buy a new car, but now climbing up to about 8 9% condition. So Fed policy essentially raising interest rate across all segments, business loan, commercial real estate loans, and also on the consumer side. The another push towards higher interest rate environment. So we have the Federal Reserve, but let's not forget Congress and the White House should also bear some degree of responsibility. In fact, the new Speaker of the House, Speaker Johnson, partly came in order to address this issue where the government spending represented by the blue bar has been consistently outpacing tax revenue by a large margin. Go to 2020, when you see the huge upward jump in the blue bar, government spending, part of the COVID stimulus. Well, we are well past the COVID condition, yet the spending today is as if we are still in COVID environment. Now you can say the composition is a little different. There are two major wars across the globe. Uh, you know, only recently some of the extra COVID benefits uh, has been reduced, so maybe government spending possibly may c come down just uh, lightly uh, next year. But this large deficit, the difference between the orange bar and the blue bar shows how much deficit and the cumulative of all this deficit is a national debt. National debt is at 100% of GDP. Ten years ago, you ask economists, this country has, or any country, any country, any uh, general country has 100% of GDP, debt to GDP ratio. What is that? People would say that is a banana republic financing. I mean, that's where we are in America, except for the fact that many other countries, European countries are also in similar condition. So this is very high. So whatever interest rate your client was recently able to obtain, say maybe 9% interest rate. 
maybe the interest rate could have been eight and a half percent, a little lower if we did not have this huge, huge budget deficit. So just uh, mentioning that deficit is also pressuring uh, interest rates to be higher. I know there will be further debate in mid-January, whether there will be a government shutdown to further address this issue, or there will be a continuing res resolution. Continuing resolution just means kicking the can down the road, and we have this continuous rise in government deficit. So let's hope that Congress, White House, they become serious uh, in terms of governing. Part of the job is governing, uh, and part of their duty would be to make it manageable so that future generation are not greatly burdened. Now, because of the uh, higher interest rate environment, Federal Reserve policy, along with large budget deficit, high borrowing costs has greatly reduced commercial transactions. Some of you who are involved in leasing, at least the leasing business is still happening. But for people looking to buy and sell properties, it is down 60% from one year ago. High borrowing costs, very difficult for the buyers. But at the same time, sellers are unwilling to reduce prices. They are saying, well, the cap rate was low, and I'm going to keep my cap rate still at low levels, even though it does not justify at this high interest rate. So you have a standoff between buyer and sellers unwilling to budge. Therefore, you don't have transactions. Transaction volumes down 60% uh, in two years. Prices have also come down. The red bar is March 2020 to show the separation line between pre-COVID and post-COVID. So pre-COVID, you see the price condition. Then prices zoom way up when the interest rates were low. Investors chasing after yields, including in commercial real estate. But as interest rate became higher, you see the transaction coming down, but also prices coming down. We have far fewer transactions to deal with but among those transacted prices, uh, the price level are now below the pre-COVID condition overall. In some of the extreme cases, say a office building in San Francisco is probably cut in half or you know, you got the major reduction in prices. The community bank has been the source of commercial lending. So you see the growth, the orange bar, how much commercial real estate loan that small banks in the aggregate has provided. So essentially, small business or I mean, small uh, community banks are your friends. They are the source of the funding in order to get those commercial transaction deals done. While the large bank, they have not really increased their exposure to commercial real estate loans. So it's the small size bank uh, that have much larger exposure. Now, if the commercial real estate fundamentals are challenge, prices coming down, far fewer transactions, then this pressure, the financial pressure from the fundamentals will hit the, the smaller size banks. So smaller size banks have bigger exposure to some uh, balance sheet readjustment needs uh, compared to the large bank, because they just have more exposure. I bring this up because as a later slide will show, I believe that the Federal Reserve simply cannot raise interest rate anymore. Because if they were to do it, I think you could potentially have a banking crisis on the small banks, and we don't want to have that. And only way to help small size bank begin to recover is to cut interest rate, which will be one of the motivating factor for the Federal Reserve next year to consider cutting interest rates. Now the economy, the latest data, factual data shows that economy is running quite strong. In the middle is COVID lockdown when the GDP collapsed. It collapsed something like 30%. Yeah, I just truncated the figures because if I was to put full 30% decline, then other figures would look to be, uh, you know, it's barely visible. And also, once the lockdown finished, we saw GDP growth of something like 30%. So huge uh, jerky reaction, right, related to the COVID lockdown. But as you can see, the latest figure in the red bar is 5.2%, and this would be considered a solid economic growth. Anything that is above 3% will be considered very solid. 
President Biden is constantly trying to emphasize economy is running strong. But if you look under the hood of this GDP figure, worrying signs are developing. And the worrying sign is the following. First, consumers. Consumers have been adding to the GDP growth. But now with credit card interest rates so high, uh, one wonders whether how long will this continue? The second, I put it in the red box as a major worry, which is the business spending growth is no longer occurring. Business spending is happening, but not growing anymore, meaning that company factory expansion may be occurring in one region, but it's being subtracted in another region such that growth is no longer occurring. And that's always happens when the interest rates are high. So businesses following the textbook example of higher interest rate, uh, they cannot continue to increase spending. The second red box is goods inventory. Now, some of you who study Econ 101, this will be a refresher. GDP, what is that? Consumer spending, business spending, uh, government spending, net export, and something called change in inventory. But people who don't know that equation, what it in essence means is that companies have been producing more things, whether more computers, more automobiles, more stuff. When you produce more stuff, it is counted as GDP. But the goods inventory is saying that we are adding to the shelf. It's not actually selling. And we cannot continue to add it on the shelf in the upcoming quarters. So that inventory figure will turn negative in the upcoming quarter, which means it will subtract GDP. So a uh, cautious uh, warning, worrying sign. And the finally, government spending still remains very solid, but with this level of budget deficit, how long can they do so uh, condition? So there are some worrying signs. Job market. So today, fresh job numbers came out. The figure begins from early 2020, right before COVID. And when COVID happened, all the people working at a hotel, restaurant, they lost job. And many other industries also lost jobs, 20 million job losses. But with each passing month since then, little more job creation, little more job creation, such that now America has 4.7 million more workers compared to pre-COVID. But let's look at under the hood on this figure. Delta, how many new jobs being added each month? And you can see that in recent month, the net job addition is becoming lighter and lighter with the possibility that in 2024, next year, could it turn negative? It's a presidential election year. Uh, you know, it's, so the job numbers are very, uh, still on the positive territory, but barely so. Not a strong positive, but a very soft positive condition with the possibility that it could dip negative uh, in the upcoming months. So, the, and the unemployment rate, Today's figure shows some decline, but you know, to just last month, last month unemployment figure, even though it's still a tight unemployment rate at near 4%, uh, it will be technically the highest in two years. One good news that came out of today's job market report is the following. The wage growth is beginning to calm down because this is something the Federal Reserve has been very concerned about. If there's a solid wage growth, and you would think that, well, more uh, wages that must be good for Americans. And the answer is no. Last year, people were getting 6% wage growth, but all that money got wiped out at the grocery store when the inflation was much higher than that. So today, people's wage growth is only 4%, but their standard of living is improving somewhat because consumer price inflation uh, is beginning to moderate. So once this figure comes down, it will allow the Federal Reserve to possibly cut interest rates. So the wages decelerating, and at first glance, you say, oh, that's bad news for the workers, but it's actually good news for the workers as long as consumer price inflation continues to go down more, and if it gives chance for the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates. Labor force, how many people participating, uh, either employed, or if you're unemployed, searching for job, 
well, now people are coming off the bench uh, because some of the COVID stimulus, generous stimulus uh, packages are ending. And now people are saying, no, I need to go out, find a job. Uh, so more people coming to the labor force, which is one of the reasons why the wage growth is coming down because more people coming on to the labor force. Here's a very interesting chart. State by state comparison. So let's look at uh, uh, Kelly's state of South Carolina, which shows 6.0%. So what does that 6.0 mean? It means that in the state of South Carolina, there are 6% more people working compared to record high pre-COVID. So South Carolina has done quite well. Georgia, 6.1% job creation done very well. Uh, North Carolina, 7.3%, one of the top performers. Dark blue would be the top flyers. So Florida is doing super well. Texas doing very, very well. Rocky Mountain State's doing well. Was it last week when governor of Florida and governor of California debated? Well, one thing is clear. Related to the job, Florida easily wins. Related to the social policy, well, you know, people will have their preferences uh, regarding whether, you know, pro-choice, pro-life and other factors, but related to the jobs, without a doubt, Florida has been clear outperformer. Now, what about Alabama? You know, Alabama always produce a good football team, but their job growth by southern state region has been an underperformer. By rest of the country, it may be about the average. Uh, so Alabama has been trailing behind other southern states. When you see some of the orange color states, they have not recovered. New York, they actually have fewer workers today compared to pre-COVID. So you see some states uh, with the low job condition, but overall, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia doing well. Alabama, slight underperformer in that regard. So. Uh, payroll jobs in Georgia and North Carolina. I just found that so fascinating when I put this figure up as I was preparing this. So this is from year 2000 to now. So it, there's always economic cycle. So it goes up. Sometimes there's a little slight retreat before uh, picking up again. Towards the end, you see the COVID lockdown. But both states have clearly come out of the COVID very nicely. In fact, governor of Georgia was one of the first governor to reopen his economy. Uh, so even though Washington was saying, keep your economy locked down, uh, Georgia governor said, no, I cannot do that. I'm going to reopen the economy. So you see how much additional job now compared to pre-COVID. Furthermore, uh, you know, back in the year 2000, there were 4 million workers. Today, it is 5 million. So if you are encountering traffic jam in Charlotte, traffic jam in Atlanta, certainly uh, for sure, well, the reasoning is this job growth situation. Now in Georgia is primarily Atlanta that is driving the jobs, while in North Carolina is more diverse. So you have the Research Triangle region, Wilmington, North Carolina, or even Asheville, along with Charlotte, are uh, really driving the job growth. But I found it quite amusing when I just Georgia and North Carolina, I mean, they're moving very similarly in terms of the actual numbers. South Carolina and Alabama are smaller states in terms of jobs. But one interesting development is South Carolina, shown in orange, has now surpassed Alabama. So 20 years ago, there were more workers in Alabama. Today, there are more workers in South Carolina. Within South Carolina is really the Charleston area, and to some degree, the Greenville region uh, has been a performer. Columbia, where actually uh, I went to high school, I went to primary school in Columbia, uh, it's been more lackluster, more slower growth in Columbia. Um, in Alabama, uh, as you can see, uh, more lighter job creation overall. This is not your region. But I thought it's still worth mentioning, especially with Florida State, it's the football team getting cheated out of the competition. Uh, but just, just put this put in perspective. Michigan used to be a heavyweight in terms of jobs. I'm moving the graph all the way to 1980. So you are looking at 1980 as a starting point. Similar jobs in Florida and Michigan. But look what has happened over the past 40 years. Florida has more than twice as many more jobs as in Michigan. 
uh, which is the reason why some of the universities in Florida, whether Florida State, uh, University of Florida is becoming more uh, selective. So many people want to attend the in-state school. And then you have the new school, which was not a factor a long time ago. University of South Florida, Florida Atlantic University, uh, other universities becoming uh, more and more uh, noticeable just because there's so many people living in Florida and they have to go to college. So you see the situation. So uh, I know this is not your region, but uh, just trying to illustrate that with faster job growth continuously, cumulatively, uh, it can really begin to show up uh, in big way. And of course, commercial real estate would be dependent upon how many job creation in the local region. Let's look at one of the commercial real estate sector, apartment construction. It is at 40 year high for three years running. You go to Charlotte and there is a construction crane and you say, what are they building? Go to Charleston, construction crane. What are they building? Atlanta is probably going to be an apartment construction. So it's the apartment construction that has been very, very active uh, in the marketplace. So with so many empty units being built, so many new units coming onto the market, you would expect that the rent condition should calm down. Uh, and here's the private sector data on the apartment vacancy. So apartment vacancy rate rising, not because of lack of renters, but because of supply. It is really the supplies that's driving, driving up the vacancy. Uh, we are continuing to see more renters coming in. So, you know, more leasing activity happening, but the vacancy rates are rising because of so much supply. And this is the government data on all rental properties, including single family rentals, uh, which one can see turning upwards from 2022 uh, to recently. So logic would suggest more supply, rent growth begins to calm down. And it is according to private sector data. So back in 2022, early portion of la last year, rents were rising by 10%. But now with so much supply, rents are only rising at 2%. In some areas like Charlotte, I believe they have to do rent cuts. There's actual reduction in rent. Uh, so rents are a little cheaper now compared to one year ago uh, because of so much oversupply situation. So rents coming down. But interestingly, the Federal Reserve is not looking at the red line. The Federal Reserve for their consistency purposes are looking at the official government data from the consumer price inflation, CPI. If you look at the CPI and look at some of their components, there is a component called rent. And the government data on the rent is showing it is still rising at 8%, much, much higher than the private sector data. And it doesn't follow the logic. Logic would say rent should be much calmer, yet government data is saying rents are still very, very strong rising. And I'm sure that in many uh, the list audit people in the audience would say, yeah, in their market, two years ago, they could raise the rent. But can they raise the rent now in a large way, 10%? And I'm sure they cannot do that anymore. Uh, but the government data is indicating as such. And consequently, uh, the consumer price inflation, which the rent is the major driver in September was 3.7%. I should have put October figure of 3.2%, much calmer inflation in October, but it is still above 2%, the desired inflation rate that the Federal Reserve wants to see, which is the reason why the Federal Reserve officials, every time they talk, they don't talk about interest rate cuts. They talk about potential interest rate hike or remaining neutral because they are looking at 3.7% inflation rate uh, condition. But if you were to use private sector apartment data, unofficial consumer price inflation would already be at less than 2%. And this would be a time to cut interest rate and cutting interest rate will greatly revive the commercial real estate sector. But for some reason, uh, the rent data in the government data is still showing solid growth and consequently uh, the Fed officials still indicating they do not want to cut interest rates. Uh, so the Fed do not want to cut interest rate, at least they are communicating as such, but the bond market, the Wall Street is saying it is time to cut interest rates. In fact, late October, 
10-year Treasury yields hit 20-year high of 5%, 5% on a 10-year. But they had a jobs data that come out soon after, and job market was soft. And now it's been trending down such that 10-year Treasury today, this morning, is 4.2%. So let me just repeat. It was 5% one month ago, and now it is 4.2%, 80% drop in such a short duration. The bond market is telling the Fed, cut interest rate, cut interest rate, or you can say cynically, bond market does not care about the Federal Reserve. We're going to cut interest rate on our own because the economy is already slowing down, and this will force the Federal Reserve to cut interest rate next year. Um, and consequently, uh, if you look at the cap rate condition, so on this graph, I put the cap rate at 4.3%, uh, and the implied cap rate, implied cap rate would be about three percentage point above that. So if you look at the cap rate of actual apartment industrials office, you can say office property prices at this moment in time is properly priced. But other properties are overpriced because cap rates are simply too low in relation to uh, the 10-year treasury or imply cap rate coming out of the 10-year treasury. So only way to make the numbers work is either apartment property prices have to be reduced. So some owners want to sell it, they're going into retirement, they have to reduce the price, bring up the cap rate in order to get the deals done, or they have to wait for the blue line to steadily come down and meet the cap rate. So I think the Federal Reserve, right now the bond market is shifting, pivoting. So as the blue line begins to come down, maybe the degree of price cut on industrial properties, retail uh, apartments, it does not have to be severe. But if they have to sell it today, only way to justify low cap rate is the following. To say, convince the buyer to say, look, Today's rents, today's cap rate is this, but guess what? Future rent will be much better. In industrial sector, the rents are rising very fast. Apartment, not so much. Office, barely positive. Retail, sort of following the consumer price inflation. So whatever the retail shops can sell at consumer price inflation, uh, well, you know, maybe the maintenance costs are also rising as similarly, uh, but this is the rent growth condition. And let me go back to the prior graph. So the cap rates right now are low. Only way to justify is to say future rent would be very, very strong. And in some sense, you may say industrial. Well, maybe they don't have to reduce the price uh, in order to uh, sell the properties. Let me go into leasing business opportunity. Some of you are involved in leasing. Well, there's very little opportunity in the office sector. In fact, I am in Washington. In any given day, if I was to walk around the street, rough guess, 70% of offices are empty, not being utilized. Official vacancy rate may be 15%, but there's so many spaces being underutilized. So once the lease comes due, it's very doubtful they're gonna do a full renewal of the lease. I think they will downscale the renewal of the lease. Uh, and consequently, uh, the this negative trend on leasing, I think, will continue for the next couple of years. The hybrid model is clearly in. I don't see people returning to office five days a week. Uh, and certainly here in Washington, federal government employees are not returning. Uh, and therefore, uh, the leasing activity is uh, very negative. Office, vacancy rate uh, rising this year to rise next year. And I think even 2025, it will continue to rise. So I'm, I'm very pessimistic related to office. So if you are involved in office building transactions, you have to convince the seller, lower the price today and get it out of the way. Because if you delay for another two or three years, property prices could be even lower as the vacancy rates rise. If you are a buyer, show this chart to convince the seller why they need to reduce the price and maybe you can purchase at a bargain. In San Francisco, uh, where there was one office building that was cut in half, uh, meaning the price was cut in half, where the new buyer, since they purchased at so low price, 
they can offer leases at much lower rent and maybe they can fill in and still make profit. So depending on which price point they enter the market. And here's the change in vacancy. So what did it change compared to pre-COVID? And looking at this market, if you look at the fourth city from the left, Atlanta, vacancy rate increased by 3%. Uh, and then other markets are not showing up. Raleigh is not showing up. Charlotte is not showing up, uh, which is very good news uh, that vacancy rate probably increased uh, not so much uh, compared to pre-COVID. Now, again, we are creating jobs. We're adding accountants. We're adding uh, business service professionals. They need office spaces. Maybe they're working remote, so the demand for office is not positive. positive. But Atlanta is showing 3% rise. Uh, but the big increases are happening towards the right Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco is an outlier. Uh, we know the dirtiness, uh, drug overdose that's happening. I mean, this is complete shameful policy. How can you allow Americans, 1,000 Americans to die in the streets of San Francisco because of drug overdose? Sometimes one wonders, you know, what our parents uh, said, tough love may be a good thing because easy love to say, okay, you can shoplift, no problem. They turn to drug use and they die on the street. This is awful uh, what's happening uh, in San Francisco, uh, but this is the consequence and the result. Uh, fortunately, uh, in your region, whether South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, uh, Alabama, the vacancy rate changes are minimal uh, in the office. Let's look at retail. Retail leasing is positive, so there is business opportunity, but then new business opportunity is beginning to fizzle out. And also consider that many of the new leasing opportunity uh, could be things like nail salon, a barber shop, something service related, restaurants, and not about selling books or selling toys. So it's more service related uh, retail leasing, fitness centers, uh, things like this. A retail vacancy rate uh, looks to be very stable, uh, no change. Um, and then if we look at the warehouses, you know, we love Amazon, online click to buy uh, things, but even the online shopping apparently is beginning to taper off. So demand for uh, industrial warehouse spaces are also coming down. Maybe like in Savannah, where there is a new automobile plant being built, I think it's a Korean automobile. Uh, so maybe they need some extra warehouses to sort of uh, store some of their uh, auto parts and things like this. Uh, so naturally, anytime companies are growing, uh, that's a leasing opportunity. But nationwide, uh, you see that the warehouse leasing activity is also beginning to taper off. Industrial vacancy rate, uh, more on the lower side, but the absolute low point of last year is ending. So, so you can see uh, that slightly higher vacancy rate. Hotel industry has fully come back. 2019 pre-COVID, about 66% occupancy. 2020 disaster, then you see the recovery. So sometimes we can never predict the future. So if you're a hotel owner, you were dying in 2020, then you went to sleep for a couple of years and you wake up two years later and everything is back to normal. But the composition of the travelers are a little different. They're more price sensitive because it's not the business travelers, but it's a individual who may want to do travel and they can do remote work. So they say, you know, I'm going to do remote work from uh, by visiting uh, Charleston. So hotel occupancy is a different group. Um, uh, but the hotel occupancy rates have already recovered. And next year, uh, it could even be better than pre-COVID condition. Uh, Long-term interest rate, so forecast, is that I believe it's going to fall for three key reasons. First, rents, government data, it will lag behind the private sector data, which means that in four, five, six months, I think the rent data in the government metrics will be much calmer holds down the CPI, giving the possibility for the Fed to cut interest rates. Second reason, economy is weakening. Remember the, at the GDP number that I showed you the under the hood? All is indicating that in an election year, uh, it could be a quite a weak economy or even a recession possibility. And to counter that, they have to cut interest rate. And the community banks are really suffering from higher interest rate. We don't want to have a banking crisis uh, and therefore cutting interest rate will help in that process. 
related to the community bank and just as a refresher for some educational value uh, is Silicon Valley Bank went under. Why did they go under? Well, they had invested their depositors money on bond, which was paying a you know, $1,000 bond that was giving 2% yield. This is before the rate hike. But when the Federal Reserve increased interest rate, what well, the bond yield also increased to 4.5%, which means that if you, for some reason, have to sell that old bond into the market, only way to do so is to cut the price by like $500 to get a 4.5% similar yield. So Silicon Valley Bank and many community banks were holding on to collateral that was losing value fast. Big banks were prepared. They went under through a stress test with Washington regulators and Washington regulators in essence told the big banks to say, readjust your balance sheet just in case interest rates are high. So the big banks are not in trouble, but the small banks were taken by surprise uh, and they were really messed up. Now, after Silicon Valley Bank went under, many other community banks could also have faced a similar uh, demise, except for the fact that Federal Reserve went to halt that crisis. So towards the bottom, special credit line, essentially to say that give us that old bond that is essentially worth about half of what it was. But the Federal Reserve will give a full value temporarily. It's a lifeline, but only for one year. This credit line expires in March 2024. So once the credit line uh, expires, what is the Fed going to do? They have two options. Cut interest rate so the balance sheet of the community bank improves or renew the credit line condition. So we'll see how the Federal Reserve do or some combination of it. But the community banks are hurting, and I think the Fed is aware of that, so they cannot afford to raise interest rate. They have to cut interest rates next year. Home sales are not necessarily commercial, but I will put it in the context of land acquisition and development, which CCIM members can get involved in. So this is my final section, uh, and let me uh, go over for next three, four minutes. So home sales are on track for another 18% decline this year after previous 18 18% decline. And it's on track, if you look at the green line, possibly the worst since 2008, or if it goes a little lower in December, it could be the worst since 1993. So tough condition for realtor members. But if you look at the home builders, completely different story. Their home sales are actually up 4.5%. So you hear all the news story about sales are down, not for the builders. Builder sales are actually up 4.5%. They're on track for third best year since 2008, uh, which happens to be a foreclosure year. So uh, third best performance. Why the difference? Inventory availability. There's simply not enough inventory on existing home side while builders can create inventory. So the builders can create inventory condition. Uh, and yes, you know that uh, existing home inventory is low because people do not want to give up their 3% interest rates. But the builders can create inventory. So sales are rising. Uh, They're making profits, a uh, good condition. Uh, in fact, home prices have appreciated, indicating that there is a housing shortage. And if you look at North Carolina, 58% price increase in three years. South Carolina, 55%, 56 in Georgia, 47 in Alabama. Alabama is a little lighter because job growth is lighter. So you see how the relationship between jobs and overall housing shortage leading to home price appreciation. This is not homes, but mobile homes, trailer homes. First, you know, we should never call them deplorables. That's just all for their Americans. You know, at a certain phase of their life, uh, they may be in financial less fortunate situation, so they are buying a mobile home. But I'm showing this graph to show that housing shortage is occurring. Prices have risen. So some people are saying, I cannot buy a single family home. Maybe I want to buy a mobile home. Well, even mobile home is becoming expensive. So very difficult condition due to lack of housing supply. This is where you come in as a CCIM uh, member. Uh, so given that the sales have come down, 
with the possibility of turning upwards if the Federal Reserve cuts interest rate. And I feel confident the Fed will be cutting interest rate. So how do you participate? Well, first, Fed to cut interest rate next year. 10-year Treasury to go down to 3.5%. Again, the cap rate situation begins to improve uh, as the 10-year Treasury goes down, which means that commercial property prices will probably stabilize rather than decline. Only office makes the continuous decline. Moderate GDP uh, will still add to more leasing opportunity and some recovery in investment sales because interest rates are lower. But the last one is we need more people to go into subdivision development, single family home development, land use development, because we are short on housing. It is going to take multiple years to really fix the housing market uh, condition. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I've spoken a lot, and I hope you can benefit in some way from this outlook. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Kelly. Thank you very much. That was all very interesting. Interesting to hear your outlook. I mostly work in retail, but good to hear the outlook on um, whether good or not on office. Interesting to hear where you see that going, especially being in the DC area there. Let's see here. I think we do have a couple of questions. Um, our first question is from Bill Moss. Where, where do you think the norm will be in the next five to seven years with money? versus the next 18 months? Uh, so let, uh, let next 18 months, I just laid it, it out there, uh, some interest rate cut, a little uh, lower. But I think going into the future is really about that budget deficit situation. So if somehow Congress keep kicking the can down the road, um, you know, the student debt forgiveness. Well, if there's a student debt forgiveness, what happens? Student debt becomes national debt. It's not like disappearing. It's just moving from one slot into the next slot. The federal debt has risen uh, if there's a student uh, debt forgiveness. So uh, if this is not addressed, then essentially only way to finance uh, this excessive government spending is for the Federal Reserve to print more money. Printing more money means higher inflation. Higher inflation means permanently higher in interest rate environment. So you could be looking at uh, you know, CPI averaging 5%, uh, which means 10-year Treasury averaging maybe 6% uh, condition. So there would be a uh, not an optimistic scenario, but something that is distinctly possible. But that's based on that if Washington is not serious, we could go into that state. Good to hear. One more question. Curious. It's I know in the Region 9 area, this has been a little more difficult to do. Probably Atlanta's maybe the only city that could try to do it. But do you see, especially in the D.C. area, more offices trying to be converted into housing? Um, I think there will be some attempt. People will look at it. Um, but I think the reality is that it's very costly to convert. The only way to make the numbers work is either there is a tax credit incentives or some government funding to do the reconversion. Um, and consequently, uh, you know, this is something that NAR is actually uh, passing on the message to the Congress to see if they can provide some tax credit incentive to convert disused commercial properties, not only about emptying office spaces, but then there are shopping malls because, you know, consumers like to shop with other consumers. So one shopping mall may be very vibrant. Another shopping mall is dying away. Those dying away shopping mall. Can you turn it into senior housing uh, along with fitness centers, some kind of combination of it? But again, it requires tax credit, uh, dollar amount to convert, uh, convert it. You know, one unique thing about your region is because of the expansion of the Panama Canal, I was really surprised to see that uh, the Savannah uh, industrial sector is really beginning to come alive. I know Charleston and Jacksonville in the past has really dominated some of the uh, shipping container ships, but Savannah, uh, when I looked at the recent figure, they did more container shipping in Savannah than in Charleston, which really surprised me uh, given more smaller size nature of the Savannah market overall. I'll use that as um, two more questions. One that I see on and that I have as well. What, um, one question, what area do you still see the Eastern coast being the best to uh, put your money into along with what areas do you, within commercial real estate sectors, do you think will thrive the most next year? 
oh, well, you are in a great region, North Carolina. It looks, you know, they're very solid, well diversified. There is a, the Raleigh area, I think will become the next Austin, Texas, uh, where it's huge growth, buy a property, buy a land there, uh, and the prices will keep going up. It's already expensive, uh, but I think it will continue to increase. Uh, you know, Charleston, uh, Savannah region, and you are getting many uh, Yankees to move in. I don't know whether you like that or not, but they're certainly bringing a lot of money with it. Uh, and consequently, that's leading to a greater uh, pressure, upward pressure on land prices on residential along with commercial uh, properties. Uh, Atlanta is fast moving. The movie production industry in Atlanta region, suburbs of Atlanta, I mean, they're becoming, trying to overtake Hollywood. So they're really doing a lot of creative work in Atlanta. So you are actually in a good, very good region. I did not say so much about Alabama, but I understand that Alabama now is getting many foreign automobile companies to locate there. With uh, union wages in Detroit becoming so expensive, uh, say Mercedes plant or say Japanese car plant, they don't consider Michigan at all. Only place they consider is Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina. Good places that people want to live and work. I can definitely reconfirm along the Eastern coast, it is very difficult to find any lands, but then also provides great opportunity, Georgia, Alabama, inland and South Carolina for people to relocate down here. Get good, good opportunities there. All right, I think that, I believe that sums up all of our questions today. I greatly appreciate your time and thank you everyone for getting on here today. Um, we will send out, there will be a recording that will be sent out for everyone that registered and then feel free to reach out to us if you have any other questions. Other than that, Lawrence, thank you again for your time and hope everyone has a great weekend.